so this is uh, all right so uh, welcome everybody i'm delighted to be here at microsoft this is my first time in the seattle area since over half my life ago and certainly the first time as a chess player and uh it's really great to see such a great turnout people who love chess so much and are you know spending their saturday mornings waking up early and uh you know coming to see me talk and uh i'd like to speak a little bit about uh some of the things I wrote about in my book, Small Steps 2, uh, Small Steps 2 Success, this is my second book, which uh, will be released to the public on November 20th, but uh, I'm giving a series of pre-release lectures across America where people can buy their copies in advance. So for anybody watching online, sorry, go to my website, we have November 20th, but for y'all who came out here, uh, the copies are rapidly dwindling, but uh, there's still some left as well as the copies of my DVD series uh, that are for sale. In any case, I'd like to start out by speaking about uh, this game here. Just uh, as a general thing, I think just talking into the ether without interacting with people is extremely boring and not a good way to learn chess. So I'm going to try to interact with the audience a bit in this lecture and uh, ask questions about what's going on in various positions. So we have a very interesting position here. Does anybody know this game? Has anybody seen it before? Looks like nobody has. I was, well, yes. Okay, who is playing in this game? <laughs> okay, so this is a game between Peter Leko and Maxime Vesci Legrab from the Olympiad in 2018. I walked by it a couple of times. I think I was playing that round. But um, so uh, we have a very interesting position in front of us. So let me tell me something interesting about it. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, black has a pass pawn on B2. And the whole subject of my book, Small Steps 2, is all about pass pawns, first in the middle game and then in the end game. So clearly, this is section is on pass pawns in the middle game. Okay, black has a pass pawn on B2. This is true. What else about this position is important to notice? Yes, sir, in the back. Uh, that's rook on E8 and hanging. Black's rook is hanging, so it should be pretty obvious it's black to move in this position. If it were white to move, it would not be nearly as interesting. Yes, sir. Is king on F2? The rook on e1 or the king on f2. Can you speak up a little bit? I'm sorry. The rook on e1 or the king on f2 are the same diagonal as the rook on e1 are getting hacked. Yes, the rook on e1 and the king on f2 are on the same diagonal. This could potentially be a good vulnerability. Yes, sir. Why do you have a rook for two pawns? Okay, that's a pretty big thing, having a giant material advantage. That's, by a traditional account, three points of material advantage. That's a lot, right? So we're saying, okay. White's king and rook are on the same diagonal. Black has a pass pawn all the way down the board on b2. And white has material up. Okay. Who thinks white is better in this position? Okay, it's one hand, two hands, three hands, four hands, five. Okay, who thinks black is better? That's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, so more people think black is better, but there are still some that think white is better. Would anybody like to defend their point of view? Because, or, or sorry, I should say, does anybody think it's equal? One guy thinks it's equal. I'll have you know they did repeat moves two moves later. And then once I deviated correctly, realizing that they should not be making a drug. Uh, somebody who thinks white's better, tell me why you think so. Yes, sir. Why is up material? Right. So the only reason why you could have to be better, like literally the only good thing about white's position is the extra material. Now, if you could contain black's counterplay, extra material is certainly enough to win the game, right? So in your opinion, if you believe white's better, it's because black, you don't think black is going to get enough counterplay to make anything happen. Is that correct? Yep. Okay, so who thinks black's better? Tell me why. Yes. Because the the cut the cut in one of the attacks by the rook on e8. And also, there's, and there's a pass pawn. Black can actually stack, plus take the rook on e1, and then like stack the two, and then put it to one of the rook takes Okay, so someone has called for some variations, takes, takes, and queens to one. And now if black were to, white were to take the queen at the end of all this, black would end up with an extra pawn and a safer game. However, is white going to take this queen? So, the key thing that drives this position is the presence of the pass pawn on b2. Yes, sir? Yeah, that and also, uh, white's going to take the exposed and the All right. So, the key thing that's going on is we have to evaluate how valuable is this pass pawn on b2. I think everyone would agree if this pawn were back on b6, that white would be completely winning. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah. Okay. So, the question is how dangerous is this pawn on b2? 
And when we start to think to ourselves in simple terms, we realize black is a dark square bishop. White currently has three pieces controlling the B1 square. That's a lot of defensive power. It's going to be very, very hard, if not seemingly impossible, to fight for control of the B1 square. So we think to ourselves, okay, the pawn is reaching all the way to B2. What are the odds that will reach B1? Yes, in the back. Um, you're all the way back there, and you just speak louder. Okay, so the problem is Black's bishop is not really going to help you make a queen. And here, it should be pretty obvious, yeah, White's king is a little exposed, but do you think you can just checkmate him? No. I mean, it doesn't seem likely. So uh, I think what's going on now... Imagine the queens were to just disappear from the board right now. What would the evaluation of the position be? Sorry? What is better? No, wrong. Black is better, even more wrong. Yes. White is completely winning. If the queens were to disappear, this game is just finished. There's nothing more to say. White goes back before an empty three, rookie one, takes the pawn, no discussion to be had. This game's over. Make sense, everybody? Yes. Okay. In fact, black is winning in this position. And it is because there's a very key idea that he can put to the test, which is uh, one of the key premises of what I'm writing around in this book, which is the key principle and guideline. If you have a dangerous pass pawn in the middle game, what is the best way to turn it into a queen? Yes? Going to an end? No. Most basically, if you have a pass pawn and you're thinking to myself, how am I going to queen it? The simplest thing you can do is just control every square in between that pawn becoming a queen where it currently is. So if this pawn were on b7, you say, okay, control the b5 square, then the b4 square, then the b3 square, then the b2 square, then the b1 square. We've got it all the way to b2 already. The next step would be to control the b1 square. Can we do that? Are we able to fight for the b1 square effectively? Yes? Sorry? Potentially from A1, rook on A1. And then? And rook on C1. Okay, rook A8 to A1 to C1 has been called. That's very slow. After rook A1, I can respond with either rook B1 or rook E8 check, aiming for either passive defense or counterplay, both of which are going to be very hard to break down. So the thing is, you're not going to easily control the B1 square. And this is where what my argument is in this book about pass pawns in the middle game. If you have a dangerous pass pawn in the middle game and you're trying to promote it, almost always the best thing to do is to attack the king. This is a, a, a principle that's often hard to understand, but it's simple. You are not going to win the b1 square by attacking it. It's not going to happen. What you can do is win control of the b1 square by stretching white's defenses and forcing his pieces to defend against unrelated threats on the other side of the board. Yes, sir. Uh, maybe rook takes e1, and then when the other rook takes, queen h2 check. Yes, that is how the game continues. So after rook takes e1, rook takes e1, queen h2 check came. So in the game, white played king f1, which is the best move. He's still losing, but it's the best try. Let's suppose he instead played king e3. Yes. Rook H, no, no, bishop H6. Okay, so after bishop H6, check if king E4. Um, F5. Slow down. F5. Queen F4 made. Queen F4 checkmate has been called. Good move. Let's say white's only other choice is to go to D4 and now like this black play. Queen F2 check? Yes, queen F2 check and the rook is lost. So first things first, we realize after queen H2 check, king F1 is forced. Now, Black gave a check, and then gave another check. Should Black make a draw here? Yes, ma'am. Um, after Queen H1 check, Queen F2, um, oh wait, yeah. yeah. So at this point, they had repeated once. That was move 38. Now we're on move 40. Black has more time. So, should we make a draw here, or should we continue the game? Continue. Okay, but how are we going to continue the game? Sorry, say that again? Maybe bishop six. Okay, bishop of six has been called. What is the point of this move? Trying to attack Q. Okay, bishop of six, what would your next move be if you had it for? Okay, so black is threatening bishop h4 and queen f2 checkmate. And funnily enough, there's not a darn thing white can do about it without letting the beep on queen. For instance, if white were to play a move like queen e3, you could play queen h1 check, 
I'm not if they need to just take this out, for example. So I'm sure there's other ones as well. I think Gosha H4 here should work. Uh, probably Queen C2 is even good enough. Um, but the point was, white had to break this blockade in order to let, in order to avoid getting made, and then the black swan went through. So white in the game played uh, rook d1, which was probably the best try. But let's say instead he went to b8 to try to attack the pawn from behind. How does black play that? Yes. Okay, that's a good start, and now I'll play queen d4. I've stopped the checkmate, and my rook is controlling the pawn from behind and threatening rook takes b2. Calculate until black wins. Yes, sir. Queen h1 check, and then b1. Can you do, and then what? Um, queen h1 check, and then b2. And... Mm -hmm. Queen h1, what will white play? He has to play king e2, right? Yep. And then yeah, what do you do? B1. And then rook takes b1. And then queen takes b1. And then queen takes h4. Or rook e2. Okay. Oops. Queen one check. Yes. It is very important to play queen h1 check. And now first play queen e1 check. If you start by making a queen, then after rook takes b1, queen takes b1, queen takes h4, white is winning. Is position. there queen h2? Queen h2. <laughs> Not two. Uh, so white is winning more ways than one. But if you start with queen e1 check, then after this b1 queen comes with check. So this is another thing, is I talk a lot about strategic themes, for example, my argument is that in general, obviously, you have to judge every position individually, but in general, one of the best ways to try to fight for a pass pawn promoting in, uh, in the middle game is to attack the king. You always have to supplement that with concrete calculation. And here, this was just checks and captures all the way through. It wasn't particularly difficult. So um, instead, uh, in the game, white played rook d1, and after bishop h4, Queen d4. Uh, what is black's best move? Careful. Yes. After b1, queen rook takes b1, how does the game proceed? And then after king e2? And you lose your bishop at the end. Yes, sir. I mean, queen h1 check. And then after king e2? Queen g2 check. And king d3? King. And then... This is the concept of the kill zone. Who knows what the kill zone is? The kill zone is the area of the board where the king is destined to die. Right now, the king is sitting in the kill zone. F1 is where he's going to get checkmated. If this king gets to C2, is he going to get checkmated? No. You're really unable to do so. So when you play a move like queen h1 check, you are actively chasing black's king away from the kill zone into the area of, or white's king, excuse me, away from the kill zone into an area of the board where he'll be significantly safer. You don't want to do that unless you see a direct flinch. Yes? C2. Sorry? Queen C2. That's not oh, no, 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 no. particularly stupid. Um, but if I play knight b4 then, and bring my knight back, you can play b1, queen, knight takes c2, queen c2, and I think you're better despite the exchange down, but you haven't knocked me out yet. My head in c6 has been a pretty stupid piece this whole game. Yes? Is it queen h1, king e2, queen g2, king d3, queen takes f3? But then king c2, and my whole point was this is my king leaving the kill zone. It's uh, kind of, I mean, if you think about like where, like if you were to play bug house and face white's king off the board, and you want to drop it on the board and choose a square where you'd be safest, I think like b1 would probably be a pretty good choice. And uh, you're sort of chasing him exactly where he wants to go. No matter how much it feels like you're in control of things or you're you're the one calling the shots, you should always think to yourself, what is my opponent's next move? What is my next move? Uh, 
Does he have an X move? Not a great one. Okay, but let's actually think for ourselves. What would Matt Weiss' next move be? Knight b4? Knight b4, knight a5, something to bring the knight to a square like d3 or c4 would make some sense. I mean, the knight is the only piece that's really not participating, but the knight takes two moves to get to anywhere intelligent. So basically, you have one move to do what you want before white's going to start taking your pawn on b2. So the problem, the only plan you have to win this game at this point is to queen the pawn, because white has sort of let the pawn go in order to save this game. In fact, you can queen the pawn right now. The problem is the bishop on h4 is hanging. All we have to do is make sure that Bishop on H4 doesn't die. Yes? Bishop G3. So if you're Bishop G3, White cannot stop the pawn from growing. He will not take the Bishop at the end. He tried Knight B4. In the events of Queen G1, Black has Queen C2. Uh, with winning position is he will promote the pawn. <coughs> he tried Knight B4, and after Queen, of course, White cannot play Queen G1 on pain of Queen takes a free checkmate. Uh, but instead, after King E2, Queen takes B1 here. And now, uh, obviously, black is winning. It took some time, and the rest of this game is no longer relevant to what I'm hoping to discuss. Uh, but I thought this was a good way to warm up and showing how uh, Vashir Lagrav was um, able to promote his pawn. And it's funny, at no point at any time in this entire game did he ever try to control the B1 square. He simply went for White's king and overloaded White's ability to defend his king on F1 and his and the B1 square, these were too far apart and his pieces were not able to contend with both threats. While if he had simply tried to fight for the B1 square, as we had seen in the beginning, for example, like when somebody called uh, the move uh, Queen C1 in this position, this doesn't make a threat, doesn't do anything. And White is ready to start playing Knight A5 to C4. So uh, this, I think, was an excellent example from MBL on the kind of stuff I'm talking about in the book of blending attacking play in order to send a pass on through. So let's move on and see another game, uh, which shares some of the same characteristics. Um, Okay, so uh, probably because everybody saw this position, they know what White played, and that's fine because the move you play here is not the particularly interesting part of the game. At this point, so this is again between Ding Liren and Jan Christophe, also from last year's Olympia. And uh, at this point, Black seems to have a pretty fine position. He's controlled the d5 square reasonably well. And if given one more move, he's going to play knight takes c4 and bishop a6 and cause a huge amount of problem for White to solve. So, uh, after some thought, but not too much, uh, Ding played d5 in order to make a pass upon. And so now here, um, I think the computer wanted to play bishop f4. It's probably right objectively, it tends to be, but that would have led to an exceptionally boring game after something like rook b7. Um, takes, takes. I take everything on d5, and then e6 will fall, and then we'll probably make a draw pretty quickly. Maybe this was the most prudent course of action in terms of pure objectivity, but it certainly wouldn't have given us the fun we're about to have. So um, instead, uh, queen h3 was played. And now black played queen f6. So at this point, Ding spent a long time. And by him spending this much time, it implies to me that he had not prepared this far when he sacrificed the pawn with d5 in the first place. I think sacrificing with d5 was born more out of necessity than anything else. Uh, but here, White has problems that he's facing. He, uh, he's a pawn down. He, the e6 pawn seems like it's going to be rounded up, and normal moves will probably not get him very far. Ding spent like over half an hour here, and while his calculation, I don't know if it was perfect, uh, it certainly looked that way during the game. But uh, he, um, Black did have a chance to sort of equalize at one point. But uh, yeah, what should White play here? Is that a hand?
Yes. Just against knight takes d5. Yeah, if you play knight takes d5, after we swap everything, I believe it's sort of time to resign. Rook b1 is coming, bishop e6 is coming, your pawn down playing a bishop pair, I think is completely lost. Yes? Did you turn off the weird thing that like, gives red and green? Because it just shows us what the answer was. Yeah, it just showed us what the answer was. <laughs> Oh, it's, like that, okay. it's fine. I'd be uh, I don't know. Maybe you guys are the biggest geniuses out there, but this it wasn't my intention to have you guys find I'd be five. If you can do that, well, Ding Laren's coming for you. But uh, anyhow, the point here is uh, White's position is pretty awful in terms of what's going on. But one asset he has is this potentially dangerous pass pawn on uh, d5. I don't know how to do the formatting thing on chess space while you're describing. I've always used demo boards in the past, but oh, you mean like these red squares? Red yeah. squares and these red squares. That's just suggesting. It's suggesting the value of it. Can okay. write it I don't know what to do, but if you want to play knight b1 and you need the computer to tell you it's a bad move, maybe you're in the wrong place. Um, <laughs> but uh, I don't know how to do that, but uh, it should be fine. So. Knight b5. White's plan is quite simple. He's going to put everything behind his pass d pawn and uh, do whatever he can to send it through. So here after gc4, I mean, like, I guess he could have played bishop here, but after bishop b2, is, it looks very problematic. So dc4 takes, and here black had his last chance to get rid of this pawn. He should have played bishop takes c6. Uh, not bothered with the knight. And here after takes, takes, and now it only move knight c6. Black is slightly better. I certainly think the most likely result is a draw with the opposite bishops and white having no bad pieces, but he needed to play this way. Um, I don't know if it was particularly because of the team situation or whatnot, and that uh, Poland was greatly outmatched by China. Poland was also beating the Olympiad in this phase. They had just beaten the U.S. in the previous round. Um, but Duda rolled the dice and took care. So E7 or E8. Now we have a situation where white is a full piece down and all he seems to have to show for it is this pawn on e7. What are the odds he's going to be able to fight for the e8 score? Black's next move might be a bishop d7. Does it seem likely we're going to quit this pawn? No. Much like the MVL game, White got the pawn all the way to the seventh rank, and it seems completely obvious that it will not get further than that, and it feels like the extra material should show. And unlike the MVL game, where Lekos Kim was obviously very open already, here, does Black's King look particularly unsafe? No, really. Okay. But with very energetic play here, White is actually winning. And it's because he's able to queen his pawn, specifically by blending attacking chess and stretching Black's defenses by attacking Black's King to the point where realistically Black can certainly save the King, but in doing so, it stretches the defenses so that the pawn can go through. So what's White's next move? Yes? Knight g5? Yes, knight g5 is best. Okay, so in the game, uh, Duda played queen g6, which is the best move. Let's say instead here to play h6, which is a mistake. Be very careful here, watch the white play. There's only one winning move and everything else loses. Queen takes h6. Sorry, what? <laughs> <laughs> Somebody called queen takes h6. Thank you, Pepper. Too many trolls in the house. No, that's Calculate until 1 to 0. And don't get tricked. Yes, ma'am. Um, yeah, yeah. Sorry, what? Okay, queen h5. And then how does the game proceed? Yes. And then? Keep on thinking. Other people have any thoughts? Yes. Um, Rook takes d6. Rook takes d6 right now. Is Black going to resign? Okay. So basically, after Rook takes d6, when you play Rook takes d6 here, you're basically saying, I believe my opponent is going to resign. Right? When you play this move. So, and indeed, it looks like he kind of should, but in fact, Black is winning. When you play a move where you make this move and you believe your opponent's going to resign on the next move in response, you don't need to make that move quickly. 
one of two things can happen. One, you're right. You're completely winning. There's nothing more to say, in which case you don't need to use any time on your clock anymore after that. You just, it doesn't really matter how much time you have, as long as it's an increment so you don't flag. The other possibility is you missed something, in which, which you have. In which case, uh, you will be very happy that you spent the time to avoid the trick. So, rook takes d6 is a big mistake. What does black do now? How does he turn the tables? Okay. Counterattacking the queen. And after queen h5. That'll be that. Black is winning. Yes? What about queen h5? Yes. It is very important to start with queen h5 first. So that black does not, so that bishop g4 is not a legal move here. Now, of course, if rook takes e7, queen e8 is made. But if bishop d7, now and only now we play rook takes d6 because uh, there's no more bishop g4 trick, and here white is playing. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, this was one little trick that black had, but, uh, and then again, he played uh, queen g6, which I think is a bit more resilient. So, yeah. <coughs> so what is a very funny and very strange looking draw available, like so, with check and check, which is a very weird looking perpetual, but uh, Ding understandably had higher ambitions and went for Quinnish. Now here I don't want to bring on Dick's parade too much by pointing out that the best move is Queen takes f4 with the f kind of funny threat of rook f6 winning. He played rook e1 which I think is the more human decision. So um, bishop d7 was now best, I think, uh, and after bishop d2 and bc, it's complicated, but white is basically on top. Um, instead, black played bishop f5, which I think is by far the most human move. His, his reasoning is pretty simple. He's got, okay, the e a square is more or less under control. The square I really want to take control of is h7, where white is threatening to checkmate me, and I had the queen there before, but now I have extra protection. Again, here, if we take one look at this, it feels like very unlikely we should be able to just force white's e7 pawn through, because black has two pieces controlling the e8 square, soon to be three with bishop g6 if necessary, and white doesn't have enough firepower to crash through. But in fact, he does, and it again comes by blending attacking black's king with trying to promote the pawn. So, what to do? Yes? But queen h5? Queen h5 is called. Why queen h5? Well, because, it's, because it's the pawn block the block the bishop. Sorry, I can't hear you. Just speak up. Oh, you got a microphone. You can talk now. It's okay. Don't force it. Uh, I have a thought on what white should play. At this point, you can calculate it all the way up to a forced win, as I'm sure Ding did. Yes, sir? Maybe rook d8? Okay, so rook d8 has been called. This is the best move. What are you threatening with rook d8? Um. You have a threat. Yeah, rook takes b8. Right. If white is allowed to play rook takes b8, he will win the pawn on the e8 square. Make sense? So currently black doesn't have quite enough defense on the EA square if it were to be white to move, but black can make a defensive move here to control the EA square as needed. Right? What should you play? Yes. Bishop G6. Right, that's what was played. So yes. Oh <coughs> wait. Yeah, 
Yes. Queen takes h7, deflecting the bishop. And then after bishop takes h7, queen takes b8. And uh, then I'm a bishop back to g6. Yeah. That didn't work very well. I also think rook takes b8 is good enough. Yeah. What's the win here? Yes. Oh, queen takes h7. Sorry, queen h7, and then bishop takes h7, and then bishop back to g6. Okay, rook takes b8 first, rook takes b8, and then queen takes h7. Then there's bishop takes h7, e8, queen check, take, take, bishop f, bishop g8, and I think you lose. Yes. And then rook takes b8. Okay, so rook takes b8, rook takes b8, knight takes h7 has been called, but then I think king g8 should say black skin. Yes. Rook takes b8, rook takes b8, e8. And then after rook takes e8? Rook takes, bishop takes, and then, oh wait. Let's do it, guys, it's pretty tough. <laughs> The best move is rook takes b8, rook takes b8, and now queen takes f4, threatening queen takes b8, and queen f8 checkmate. So here black is in a bit of a dilemma. He can stop checkmate or he can save the pawn very easily, but he can't do both. For instance, if he plays rook e8, you're definitely not queening this pawn. It's impossible, but you are giving mate on f8. Make sense? The only way for black to stop mate on f8 is to play rook g8. However, what does white do now? Yes. No. Well, not immediately. Sorry. Queen f seven is flashy and silly, and you don't want to be a show off. What's the What's the professional move? And queen f seven works, but to, you're risking some missing something when you do something strange like that. Like queen f seven, queen takes c one. Like it's kind of yeah. Yes, knight f7 is the professional decision takes at the end of all this. Or it seems like a miracle when you consider the position a few moves prior that White would actually win the fight for the EA square because now he's obviously queen of the pawn, Black's not stopping him. Uh, but he did it largely because he was attacking Black's king and forcing Black to make critical decisions. As we saw, Black could have very easily stopped this pawn from queening if that was the only thing that he was trying to defend against. And if White had been trying to just fight for the EA square, he would have lost. But because White was threatening Black's king at the same time, Black couldn't keep both things above water at once. So these two examples we've looked at have been very extreme cases of what I'm trying to talk about, of how a passed pawn can be a very valuable attacking unit, even if it is not in the vicinity of the king by distracting the pieces and whatnot. Well, these were extreme examples because in both cases, the, the side with the pass pawn had invested a lot of material to get the pass pawn really far up the board. But there are much more calm situations where the same principles can apply. So let's look at another game here. This one was a game of mine with uh, Ivan Shuk, uh, which I quite liked. Okay, so... The opening didn't go very well for me. I ended up a bit worse, but I fought back reasonably nicely. All right. Um, we start here. At this point, while I was playing the game, I believe black was fine. Uh, I thought the C pawn is clearly under control. It's not going anywhere. I don't have any major weaknesses. Uh, but in fact, white is a bit better, and he has a very dangerous plan at his disposal. First question, what should I play here? Yes. Yes, queen c3 check is a very important move. The only thing, this past c pawn, is like and promoted just by like fighting for the c6, c7, c8 squares? No, and black clearly has them under control. He can play rook c7, rook c8, and even try to argue this pawn is a weakness. If the queens were to trade, black would be absolutely fine. For instance, after something like bishop takes d5, d6, if white plays queen c3 check now, it's too late because black can respond with queen f6. White has to acquiesce to a queen exchange. And after something like this, say rook c7, rook c8 comes next, black is absolutely fine. 
the safe line is the only cause of concern for him, and he clearly has it under control. Does that make sense to everybody? So what I want to do is avoid the exchange of queens. And starting with queen c3 check is a very important decision as a result because he had to do it right away. If he, as I said, if bishop takes d5, e6, he no longer can play queen c3 in between because there's queen f6. So the game continued, queen c3 check, king g8 takes queen c7. And here I didn't really understand why black would be worse. I thought, okay, I can contest the open d file. The space advantage that I was suffering against in the beginning of the game is long since gone. And the C-bond just doesn't seem that dangerous, but in fact it is. What should I play now? <coughs> Actually, I think you'd better get C-1 for a second. Rook C-1, Rook D-8, whatever. Um, but we'll get to the next one later. So here, uh, yeah, let's, okay, let's go here. Um, what should I play now? Setting the plan in motion. Yes. Uh, queen f3, then I'll play knight e5. Queen f3, knight e5, queen f4, maybe then I can play e6. You start have to worry about rook takes d1 and queen takes c5. Things didn't really go too well there. Checking timers just a second. There you go. Let's go. Oh, okay. All right. Um, and also, I thought, yes. Bishop takes c6. And then after queen c6? Um, rook takes rook. Okay. Rook takes d8. Rook takes d8. And the queen a5. Queen a5, you say? Yeah. Okay, and then rook d7, rook d5, something like that. <laughs> Are you going to be able to remove my queen from c6? I was thinking about bringing the queen to b6, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to try to... But let's say after queen f5, I play like rook c8 or rook d7, and I meet queen b6 with like even take it and rook to b7, mm -hmm. and black should be fine. Yes? Queen b3. Queen b3, why? Uh, the, the attacking f7. Do you think I'm not going to see it? No, he's going to play e6, right? Yes. Mm, and then after f takes c6, queen e6, king c7, you're out of checks. You could. Um, no, I don't think it will work very well. Um, you can play like rook c8 or something. You might have a perpetual, but you're not going to have more than that. Also, to be simpler, I think after queen b3, e6, bishop takes e6, I should play knight d4. And then you will lose an exchange. When I, you clearly don't have a perpetual done. Um, other thoughts? H4. White wants to attack the king. He has a very simple plan. H5, H6, checkmate. And the problem that black is facing is that the best way for him to combat this plan, which you would say is a normal, very dangerous plan in a case where you fiat cut of your king's bishop and lost it, is to take control of the long diagonal. The easiest thing black could possibly do would be something like queen e5. What could be more natural? Take control of the long diagonal, you will never get checkmated. Right? <coughs> Does this work for black? Why not? Queen f3, knight d4, I think black is in good shape. Good. Uh, queen f3, knight d4, queen f7, king h8, stuff is hanging. d5 hanging, e2 hanging. Rook f8 drops the queen. Okay, black's okay here. And what happens after queen e5? Queen f5, knight Yes. Then rook takes the one check and black wins. Yes. Yes. 
Black was prevented from playing the generally desirable defensive move queen e5 because that meant he had to break the blockade on this pass pawn. Essentially, Black was trying to stop these threats along the long diagonal towards like g7 while also containing this pawn c5. And as a result, here, this pawn is just going to become a queen. For instance, after rook c8, c7, if you play rook d7, there will follow f4 with bishop takes f7 coming. Or uh, if rook d6, you can also play f4. And after like knight g4 or something, go rook d3 and you cannot stop bishop d7. So essentially, it's funny that this pawn c5 is what makes white's attack so strong, but that's really what it is. If black's b5 pawn, for example, were back on b7 and black were able to safely play queen e5 here, is it black would easily dispel any hope white had of just shoving this h pawn down the board and launching a mating attack. Does that make sense? All right, so. Um, I played rook bc8, which was probably not best. I believe, for better or for worse, I had to play h5. Uh, I still think y's better, but then I could have fought back. And then after h5, here, uh, what I wrote in the book was, I play e6, um, and what I wrote in the book was, I'd like to believe I would not make such an idiotic move if uh, I had not been under pressure from a lot of angles at once. I, if white had played h4, h5, it should not be too hard for me to figure out what his plan was, right? But here, everything wins. I think the easiest is probably to take this guy and then play h6 next, and I think black's just made it. Um, Ivanchuk played h6 directly. Uh, and then after knight e5, um, if I had played queen e5 again, yes, I've stopped the immediate checkmate, but the c pawn wins today very easily, too. I cannot take twice on d1 and take c5 because of rook d8 mate. And after something like this, like, yeah, I stopped the mate, but the c pawn clearly wins the game. Uh, so I tried knight e5, and then bishop e7 was quite enough, and the rest of this game is no longer relevant. But the point was, even in a much more calm position like the one we're looking at here, uh, white's attacking potential was increased enormously due to the presence of this passed on in c5, uh, which was nowhere near the queening square. It wasn't like it was one move away from queening like it was in the previous games. The material was equal. It looked like a much more normal position, but the same principle still applied. The danger of the c5 pawn was not in the end game, it was in the middle game, where it could distract my pieces from saving my king. And the blending of these threats to the king and to uh, and of promoting the pawn is what led Avantra crash through. Does that make sense to everybody? All right, so let's move on to one from the exercise phases of, uh, of this chapter, which I quite like. Um, okay, so as you can see here, as I wrote, Black has sacrificed the rook to get his pawn all the way to e2, but it's not easy to go further. How should he proceed? Now, there's more than one way to win this game, but there's only one that actually cleanly finishes it. A lot of others will still be, compli still be complicated and still require some work. There's only one way to just end this game. It's tough. And Gureyev was 26-54 at the time, and he, he even managed to almost lose this game. So... What should like to take it? This is from the puzzle section, so this is more about solving than about knowledge. It's now ten fifty six at eleven o'clock. I'm gonna see if People have some opinions and maybe take a poll of who wants to play what. Discuss. People can share their points of view and tell me why they believe they do the things they do. Um, well, I was hoping we'd wait a few more minutes, but uh, I hadn't considered that move either, so I don't know. But uh, I will think about that move while everyone else thinks about it. I suggest I want to take a little more time on that. Just give it a few minutes. You might have missed something, especially if you think you're winning the game on the spot. You want to take your time.
A couple more minutes, we're going to take a poll of the room of who wants to play what. Alright, so everyone's had a time to think of a show of hands. How many people are ready to make a move? Fair amount of people. Okay, what move would you want to play? Rule D8. And you? Okay, uh, you? Bishop D3. You? Bishop D2. You? Bishop D3. You? Anyone else have a move? So far, I've heard like a lot of different people on a lot of different moves. Yes. F5. Okay, I've heard F5, rook e8, bishop d4, bishop b2, bishop g3. Have I heard any others? Anybody have a move I didn't mention? Yeah, so clearly, there's a lot of possibilities here, and a lot of people have come to different conclusions. Yes. Queen d1. Queen d1 as well. Okay, so we have queen d1, bishop b2, bishop d4, bishop g3, f5, rook e8. Is there a move that someone else wants to play? Yes. Bishop f4. Bishop f4. Okay, so now we have bishop f4, bishop d4, bishop g3, bishop b2, rook e8, f5, queen d1. That's seven different candidate moves we've come up with. Unsurprisingly, one of them is correct. Would somebody like to defend their point of view, why they chose the move they did, and what they calculated to try to win the game? Yes. I thought queen d1. Uh, after king e2? Uh, yeah. uh, or king f2, excuse me. Uh, queen d3. Um, and then if I take your bishop, that's a problem. Yes. Queen d1, king f2. Can you play bishop d4? And then after king g3. Uh, yes. Uh, dangerous is the right word. Uh, lost would be what we're looking for. So, yeah, bishop d4 check. I think king h2 is better than king h1. Either way, you will go bishop e3, and then after rook takes and queen takes queen e1, uh, you're still a piece down, and it's not that easy to get your pawn through. Um, I'm ready to perhaps play rook a3 next and expel your queen. I do think it's very dangerous. My guess is black is better, but you're starting to slip. Yes? So you think bishop g3 is going to move because what? Okay, uh, bishop g3, let's suppose I just chop on e2. At this point, material is equal. You're probably not like checkmating me directly. You may win a pawn on c5. I think probably with like an absolute perfect rule, my guess is bishop g3 does win the game, but let me put it to you this way. Uh, if you play bishop g3 against Magnus, are you going to beat him? Probably not. But if you find the best way, you will beat him. Yes? Um, after f5, he has to take, otherwise he loses an exchange. And after he takes... Then How much do you think what cares about losing an exchange right now? Uh, not that much, but and you're good. you might still have something like a queen d1 check, and after king f2, f takes g check. And then you can queen. Next move, anything goes like king g3. Well, the main after f5, f5 is clever. Uh, and your point is if rook takes e5, you want what exactly? Uh, queen d1 check. And then king h2? 
I was also thinking about queen d4 check and then you take the rook. Yeah, uh, after f5, rook e5, queen d4 check, my guess is black is still better, maybe even winning, but uh, you're, you're definitely losing the threat. You guys are thinking in the right way. It seems like none of you are trying to mate white's king and none of you are trying to quit the pawn. You're all trying to blend these two ideas together, which is the only way you're going to win. Um, but... Uh, did anybody else have a move they thought of? I heard other moves as well. Yes. Bishop takes b2. Okay, Bishop takes b2 was played in the game. Did anybody else want that? And why did you want Bishop takes b2? Uh, it deflects the queen, so let's say queen b1. Yes. Now queen d1 is much more potent because the queen's uh, on the Right, because then the white queen is undefended. So yes. Bishop takes b2. And then I can't play queen b1, so what am I going to play? Let's say queen a2. Okay, and then? <coughs> I think I just queen the pawn. Yeah, so bishop takes b2, queen a2, and queen the pawn, and it, it seems over. So basically, this is another one of those cases. You're telling me after bishop b2, you believe white's going to resign. Probably close to. So bishop takes b2 is played in the game, and... <laughs> I don't know, a few seconds, of course, like you, he blundered rook to seven. I wish my black is lucky not to be lost. Um, yeah, so the game continued bishop b2, and the point is, of course, queen d1 is going to come if you believe the queen undefended. Of course, queen i5, bishop c3 never helped anybody, but after rook d7, uh, black is very lucky that he's not lost. He will lose his e2 pawn now. And after takes, takes, Check here, f5. Uh, the game continues. And if white was able to play king g3 safely, he would probably be winning. Unfortunately for him, queen d3 is made, so he has to play king e3, and then black still is in pretty good shape. But there is an easier way. There, in fact, uh, we've been just one move away from the solution at one point while discussing, but uh, people have not found the last move, which is the toughest one. The first couple of moves are easy, but uh, they're only easy if you see the last one. Maybe queen d1 check. Okay, so queen d1 check, king f2, and then? And then bishop, bishop g3 check. And then king takes g3? No. That was a valuable bishop you just gave me. It's a tough problem, but uh, when you consider the principles at stake, it becomes easier. And black didn't even come close. Now, I don't know if black didn't come close specifically because he saw bishop b2, just concluded it was winning, and then played it without considering rook b7 was coming because he played so quickly. If he had more time, knowing the style that he more tends to play with, my guess is he would have found it. But uh, it's, it's very hard to find the win if you don't know that you should be looking to blend attacking white's king with trying to promote the pawn. Three over, but it's very tough. <laughs> yes, I'm back. Bishop d4, king h2, and then? Give it a couple more minutes before I go over the solution, see if anyone wants to take a try. Yes, sir. 
Rook A8 was the one that we hadn't discussed yet, but I don't know what you do after Rook A8. My Rook on A7 is exceptionally useless, and trading off, trading it off seems like a good idea. What about Queen D1, King F2, Bishop D4, King D3, Bishop D1? Bishop G1. That's a move from outer space. What's the point? That black, that white doesn't know how you move. How about Rook takes E2? Oh. And then your Bishop on G1 is hanging. What was your intention with Bishop G1? If I just pass through the way. Sorry, what? Like with D8 or D3. All right, we're, we only have like half an hour left, and I wanted to move on. Yes? Maybe Bishop G3 ended in Queen D1. Well, Bishop G3 was with Rook takes me to, and you're probably winning, but it's it will take a lot of effort. Yes? Queen D1, check on the King of 2, D1. And then after Rook takes you one? Bishop G3. Yeah, King G3. Rookie oh. Sorry? Rookie Queen D1 check, King F2, Rookie H. Uh, Rookie A8. Rookie G4. It's starting to get goofy and it's not going to work, I think. Um, I will mean, only have like half an hour after, or a little less even because I wanted to save some time for Q&A. But, uh, so I want to go over the solution because I did want to touch on some endgame stuff, which obviously is part of the book as well. The win, the win for black is queen d1 check, bishop d4 check, and I have this very funny move, bishop takes c5. And the point is black now has two threats. Bishop takes a7, takes the rook for dead nothing, and that rook because, because white cannot take back, I'm paying a d1 queen. And more brutal, queen d6, queen d3 is checkmate. Well, I can very easily stop one of these threats, you cannot stop both. Like, you can play rook a6 and he gets mated, as such. Or he can uh, play something like b4, for instance, to clear the e5 square to defend, and after it takes the pawn points. Yes? How do, you, how do you even look for a move like bishop c5? I mean, that was just. It's a very difficult move that a 2650 player at the time didn't find. Uh, but it's, it helps a lot to be thinking about these guidelines that I'm trying to propose. I mean, these guidelines I've come up with on how to approach the position, which I constantly write about in my books, uh, that you should be looking for ways to blend attacking with defense, or sorry, blending attacking the king with queen the pawn. This is, uh, this is what you need to be looking for. Because this bishop takes c5, you might think this seems incredibly hard to find, but it's also incredibly easy to understand. There's no in this room who doesn't understand what just happens or why this works. This is clearly within your capability of, it's not like some foreign entity came in and explained to you some bizarre thing in chess that you just don't get and it beats you and all you can understand is that it won. No, this is a three mover that everybody in here perfectly guessed why it wins. The question, the gap is understanding why it wins and finding it on your own. And that's the hard part that we're working on. Um, in general, I've always believed that Chess excellence is most broadly broken down into a subset of two very specific categories, knowledge and skill. Now, knowledge is very easily transferred from one human being to another, which can be from a book or from even word of mouth or a DVD series, whatever you want. You know, if you read an opening book, you didn't know how to play the Slav, and now you write a book on the Slav, well, now I know as much about the Slav as the guy who wrote the book, or at least as much as he was willing to share. Fine. 
This is skill that we're talking about, finding the blood bishop takes c5, and it's much harder to transfer skill from one human being to another. And I'm doing my best by writing this book. That's why I cover games like this, and I put this specifically in the puzzle section as opposed to in the ex explanation section. But, uh, yeah, this is hard. Chess is a hard game, but if you put the time in, you will get better. And I'm, uh, I think this was a good example of, you know, uh, we saw some easier cases. I went from, like, easiest to hardest in terms of the four games I presented on this topic. Uh, this was certainly the hardest one to find, but it's within your capability. That's what makes great players. Yes. I can't hear you speak up. Bishop takes a three. Yeah, the point is black is either going to give mate or queen the pawn, and you can choose which one you want to allow. Uh, but this, I think, you know, this is not a crazy composition. This is a real game position. It's a three mover. That should be within human capability. It's hard, but it's it's possible. Anyhow, I'd like to move on for just a little bit before I move on to Q&A, just to talk a little bit about the other section. So this was chapter three from my book, which talked about lone past pawns in the middle game. Uh, moving on, the book is 14 chapters, six of which take place in the middle game, and eight of which take place in the end game, just because past pawns tend to be more relevant in the end game. And I take on somewhat different characteristics. Like, in general, if you have a lone past pawn in the end game, if you have reduced material, it's pretty hard to just launch a mating attack on the other side of the board, so that's why these kinds of principles are more specific to the middle game. Let's move on to chapter 8, where we talk about playing against connected pass pawns, which most people would think the best thing to do tends to be to resign. Eight. Okay, chapter 8. All right, two, two, that's why. Okay. Um, so, let's start with this game here. Talking about connected past pawns, uh, more often than not, you are not going to be able to stop them. That's why they're as dangerous as they are. Obviously, there are exceptions. If you have pawns on c4 and d5, and you have a bishop on c5 and a king on d6, you have a pretty good chance of setting up a blockade. But particularly if they're side by side, you're not very likely to be able to do that. So, oftentimes when the majority of cases come and you cannot stop the, protect the connected pass pawns, the best thing you can do is make something happen elsewhere before these pawns become queens. In a sense, slow them down, don't try to stop them. What is the best way to slow down protected pass pawns? Or connected pass pawns, excuse me. Yes? Going in front of them, and then... No. Your pieces will get attacked and you will lose time. Yes? Well, that's your goal to, to win the game. That won't slow down their pawns, that just accelerates your play. How do you slow down your opponent's pawns? Yes? Well, that's what you know. Your goal is to do something on the other side, but in order for that to work, your thing has to be faster than their thing. Yes? Put their pieces in front of their pawns. Yes, put your opponent's pieces in front of their own pawns. In general, if you think about like an end game, let's say you've got connected past pawns, and you've got your king and your rook are in front of each of your two connected past pawns, those pawns will promote. There's no way you're going to stop them. Like, if you can imagine this situation, imagine White's king was on b5 and White's queen was on a5 and White's pawn was on a4. The odds of black actually stopping these pawns are zero, but they are going to be slow. While black's pawns, conversely here, who also has connected passers, his pawns are not blocked by his own pieces. So black only has one winning move in this position. What is it? To calculate a little bit. Yes? H5? No. H5 basically is ignoring white's play and going along with your own play. After something like H5, B5, H4, B6, H3, B7, you're just sort of racing and counting who is ahead. And I don't think it's you. I think it's about equal. I mean, you could easily see a situation with six queens showing up this game and the F7 pawn's pretty irrelevant. It's 
H5 is not the right. It's the, obviously what you want to eventually do, but you have a much more important move first. Queen C7? Yes, Queen C7 check is a very important move. And the point is White's King must go to B5 or else he will lose a pawn. So after King B5, now and only now we play H5. And here, White's pawn, specifically the more advanced B pawn, has been slowed down. Clearly, Black will not stop the A and B pawns, but because he is able to, he was able to force White's king to B5, that B pawn has become significantly <laughs> slower, and Black is close to win the race in a variation like this one. Does that make sense to everybody? Yes? I was just wondering what happened to King D4. King D4 was played in the game, and then after Queen A7 check, uh, the pawn was lost. Okay. And White tried... Uh, White like, brought his king in front of these pawns to try to slow them down, which brings me to my next point. If you're facing connected pass pawns with heavy pieces on the board, do not try to stop the pawns with your king. You will get checkmated. What happened in the game, I could actually pull this up from uh, 201. Hang on just a second. Because this, this was from chapter 201 that I first introduced this game. Slow typing with more hands. I think this was first here, yes. So what happened in the game? Um, so we can skip through because it wants to end up yet. Yeah, so at this point here, when I previously pointed this out, if we were to apply this guideline retroactively to white queen four was actually a pretty serious mistake here because it allowed Queen C7 check to force White's King in front of the pawns. Queen D4 check would have saved the game, uh, but this requires a lot of calculation in that game, which is very difficult. That's not to say it can't be done or that it's a bad move, of course it's best, but I think the most human solution would have been Queen E5 check, F6, and now Queen E6. When since the A2 pawn is protected, and White can happily put his King on C4 or wherever, no amount of checks Black will ever give will force White to uh, move his king in front of one of his pawns. And I think here the white should be fine. Um, for example, here if king b5 he will lose, but if he plays king d5, I think white's okay. Black cannot force the king in front of the pawns. So um, at this moment, but if you look at what ended up happening, is uh, white actually sort of quote unquote run, won the race to the back rank at the end. The problem was because white's King got in front of the pawns, the third rank was quite enough for black pawns. He did not have to get to the first rank because they're just checkmate. So, in general, if you're facing connected pass pawns with like bishops, yeah, your king can be a decent blocker. So, the heavier the pieces, the less likely that's going to be. And this was no exception. White just got made without any particular discussion on these pawns went down the board because he had the heaviest possible piece and the queens with the queens. And that, that meant. The black only had to get his connected pass pawns to the third rank to win the game as opposed to the first rank. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, so moving back to chapter 8, which we were looking at. This concept of placing your opponent's pieces in front of their pass pawns to slow them down is a very important one to understand. So if we check a game that was uh, played... Alright, let's go back to 201 again. Um, in general, I covered the same topic in back-to-back -back chapters, once playing with the pawns, once against them. So sometimes you'll see similar kinds of positions in back-to-back -back chapters. But uh, let's check this Lee Chow game. Um, where is this? Okay, so uh, this Lee Chow game was also long, so let me go to... Uh, Alright, so, uh, so we see this position here. Uh, will black stop white's pawns from becoming a queen? No. The constellation white currently has guarantees that his pawns will promote. Uh, however, it is slow because the rook is very clumsily placed. So uh, white only has one winning move, and we'll get back to that. Um, he played the rook c7, which was a mistake. Now, uh, Black can save this game. Is he going to save this game by running the king back and trying to stop the pawns? Yeah. No. The only thing he can do is make counterplay. <coughs> so check. Let me start checking. White wants this way, and now after uh, f3, 
It's not so easy because black is threatening F2. If white were to play rook F7, this is one of those cases now where blending the attack and defense should be enough to uh, save the game because now white is overworked and has to, the rook has to leave. Um, King G3 was played. Now, um, black played King E3, which technically speaking still draws the game, but it is absurdly difficult. He had a much better move at his disposal. Especially if like. <coughs> yes. Rook G1 check? Yes, Rook G1 check is the best move. And now, uh, White has to be careful. If he plays something like King H3 after F2, he's probably going to even lose. I don't know. Maybe Rook F7 saves him here because of F1 quitting a little bit left, but this is clearly wrong. Um, so check, King F2, check, and now King F1, and the Rook comes back to B2. And the problem White is facing is, well, his pawns clearly will queen are very slow. So for instance, after B7, we just start checking. Check forever. If uh, if white ever tries to play something like king h2, then f2 will promote the pawns. And he can try this, but now, at this point, what's we going to do? This f pawn is extremely dangerous. f2 is coming. For instance, rook c8, f2, and black wins. At this point, white needs to make a draw with something like rook e7, check king b5, rook f7. This would have been the way. I think it's pretty straightforward, and it would hold. But the point was black did not try to stop these pawns, and that this rook being on c7 slowed them down a lot. Uh, instead, after king e3, technically this is still a draw. After rook f7, uh, king d4, uh, rook f5. Here, black can draw with a perfect move, f2, king takes f2, rook b3, and then defend that position for 50 moves. I think Leech is very strong. I don't mean to insult him. I think that's outside of his capability. I think that might be outside of Magnus' capability. That is inhuman. Um, he tried king e4, and then uh, white played rook f8, and now black now up the pawns. After king d5, rook c8, rook b3, and rook c7, white, black's king is not too far away. In any case, the pawns went through. Makes sense to everybody? As we saw, though, rook g1 would have saved the game. With that in mind, um, let's find a better move than rook c7. Yes? Rook e6. If rook e6 can be 5, then you lose your pawn. Does white need to queen both of his pawns? Mm -hmm. One would be quite enough, right? You get your rook out of the way. Rook f6. Um, f rook f6, king d5? Yes. Rook where? Rook e6. If rook e6, king d5, you lose your pawn. Yes. So rook d6? Rook e6. Rook b5 then? And then c6? And then rook takes b6. I have a check on rook c1. What should a white play? Good question, actually, to think about. Which pawn do you actually want to queen? Yes. Why? Because it's closer. Okay, is the rook behind the B pawn or the C pawn? Um, the C pawn. So which one is currently unobstructed? Mm -hmm. No, the B pawn is obstructed. The rook on B2 is stopping it from advancing. The C pawn, in theory, could advance. So, what's the winning move? Yes? Rook D6? Uh, rook D6, I think rook B5 will save the day. Yes. Uh, rook f6. And then if rook b5. This rook b5 was very annoying. It attacks your c5 pawn, which is hard to defend. C6. And then rook takes 
and I will have a shotgun C1. Yes. Yes, for C8 is the way. And the point is, White is now ready to play C6 and then not have that pawn be obstructed by the rook uh, in order to play C7. So, for instance, after a check, let's say we played in the same manner as the game King G3, and now uh, Rook G1 check. This, we had this exact same position in the game, but with the rook on, uh, on c7. Or we could have had the exact same position. But in this particular case, because the rook has gotten out of the way, c6 is now winning because we have the check and our c7 first is fine. It doesn't matter either way. Uh, c7 is the check will be enough to win. Yes? Um, so at the moment that rook c8 happens, I think maybe now you can play rook c7 and black's king is farther away. As we saw, he only drew by one tempo. Now, for instance, black's drawing mechanism was to go, was to start perpetual checking you and pointing out that you can't step in front of the pawn. Now, if black starts checking, I will go king f2, king f3. So black would have to bring his king back to e4, and now this should be a very critical tempo that white is one. Well, that's a good question. Okay, so we're going to get one puzzle that I'm going to do before we do Q&A, which comes down to putting, uh, well, you'll see. Um, okay, what I wrote for the premise of this puzzle, as you can see, it's white to move, or sorry, it's black to move, time to resign, question mark. While you guys are doing that, it's time for me to do my hand exercises. So, <laughs> take me two minutes to do that. We'll see if you guys can find how to save the game in the meantime. Check. Oh. Rook how do you how do you think again? We'll go after rook f4 check. Try to force the king to a6 with the rook on b7. Then I think. Sorry, the rook on b7. Or sorry, uh, f7, and then you can maybe run the check going king b3, and you rook b7. So rook f4 check does save the game. Uh, you don't need to put the king all the way to a6 as soon as he's in front of one of the pawns. Uh, it. So like king b5. Well, king b5. Then rook f5, king c6. Rook f6, king d7. Oh, as soon as he's in, as soon as in front of one. Okay. Yeah, as soon as, as soon as he's in front of one, you, you should be fine to play king d3. Uh, so, the way the game went, uh, black um, played king e 3 immediately, which obviously costs white his rook, but that certainly wasn't enough to save him, because here the pawns are going to go through. But he could have saved the game by playing rook f4 check and then just incessantly checking white's king, <laughs> as white cannot approach the rook because then the rook coming to the fifth rank will harass the pawn. So, for instance, after a check, white cannot play something like, yeah, so check. If you play something like king g7, just rook back to f5, and uh, you'll have to play king c6. So, the only place that white can theoretically hide his king is in front of his pawns. And as we see here, now that the white king is on b7, he is in front of the pawns, which gives black enough time to get back. Because, you know, an extra rook is extra material, which gives him good chances to stop the pawns. But I'll point out that uh, here, I think at this point, white should just play a7, except that this is a draw. If he plays b6, he's actually asking for trouble. But if we consider this position, you could put white's king basically anywhere on the board, even somewhere totally stupid like h1, and he would be winning. The reason that this is a draw is because White's king being in front of his pawns has slowed them down enough that Black was in time to defend it. In fact, after king b5, the only drawing move now is king a7. Well, a7 would actually lose to rook, rook uh, a7 check. Make sense, everybody? All right. So we have like a little over 10 minutes left. I'd just like to open up to general q and It can be about anything you want, the book, uh, topic at hand, unrelated topics, me and my life and chess, literally anything.
you ask something super personal, I might not answer it, but you know, uh, I will uh, do my best. Um, and as I said, this lecture was on my book, Small Steps to Success, uh, which I'm selling here as a pre-release event. It's not released to the public till November 20th. I don't have so many copies left, but anyone here who doesn't get a copy uh, because they run out, I'm happy to mail them to you in advance. For viewers online, I can't do that. I'm only allowed to uh, give copies to people who are actually coming to these pre-release lectures. But if you're online, you can certainly buy it from my website. It just won't ship until November 20th. Uh, I also have my DVDs on sale as well. Okay, uh, any questions anyone has, fire away. Yes? So what were the biggest factors that led to your US championship victory? Um, I played, I was on really good form when I won the US championship. I also got pretty lucky at a couple of cases. Um, like, for example, you know, I was only really lucky in one specific game, like against the Kobean, when I was in some trouble and uh, he didn't find a way. I also had a dangerous position against Robson, and I think just based on their styles, if you had swapped opponents and given them the same positions, there's no way I win both games. I might even lose both games, because the Kobean game was very tactical, and that would have been right up Ray's alley. Well, uh, Ray got a strategically nice position that Kobean might have played well, so I kind of got lucky in that regard, um, but... I was just working very hard for many years, and you know, stayed the same rate for three and a half, four years. It's kind of hard to believe I was just stuck there as a you know guy in his early twenties, working hard and improving. I would think that you should get somewhere, and I think it all just sort of came together at the right time. Okay, I also got lucky, for example, like that uh, I played Carwana the day after he had this horrible game with Desoria because he played you know, some really stupid opening that I don't think he would do if he wasn't tilted. Um, yeah, you know, there was some luck, but I was I think most of the improved. Yes. When you say working hard, like I'm just curious what that entails. Like, are you just mostly doing opening preparation, that kind of thing, or like how do you how do you spend your time? Uh, I do a lot of calculation work, just because I think calculation is the most important skill uh, in chess. I mean, if you look at these computer programs like Stockfish or Komodo that are written by 2000s, they should not understand chess better than I do, but because they calculate so disproportionately better, that's why they beat us. Uh, so obviously we're not computers, we can't think the way they do, but clearly they have proved that just calculating well is enough to be incredibly dominant. And so obviously I cannot achieve the kind of calculating superiority that computers can, but I try that a lot. So I have all these exercises that I do. I do opening works as well. As well. When I wake up in the morning every day, even like today, for example, I was checking the instruments about like the, the playoff games. So, because uh, I live in the Pacific time zone, you know, tournaments in Europe and Asia are anywhere like 9 to 15 hours ahead. You know, I literally wake up the first time you do a check the game to see what's been going on. So it's it's pretty nonstop, but uh, and obviously during tournaments I play, but uh, yeah, a lot of calculation work, a lot of game work, a lot of other work, everything. Yes? So when, uh, right, with the game, sometimes you don't know what to do. Does it ever happen to you? Like, how do you overcome that? Uh, it happens a lot less as you get more mature and you have a better feel for the game, and that just comes with time. Uh, my coach, Jacob Agard, who's also my publisher for this book, famously came up with the three questions, uh, which you should always ask yourself if you're confused um, or what to do. The three questions are, what's my worst place piece? Where are the weaknesses? What's my opponent's idea? If you ask those three questions, you often find yourself finding more ideas. Obviously, most of what Jacob says is total nonsense, but this one you got right. Yes. I saw you play a wonder. Yes. He's a young boy. What's his table manner like? Um, I don't notice people's table manner uh, at all. I just focus 100% on the game. I remember when I got knocked out of the World Cup in, uh, in 2015, someone, uh, I think one of the interviewers said, you know, because I lost to Hikaru and in tie break, and he had been struggling with me for a while, but uh, in the game where he finally beat me and sent me home, like, it was clear he was frustrated to a point that he hadn't beaten me yet, but this game he clearly outplayed me and won. And when he finally got a winning position, I guess he made some kind of strange faces or whatever, but, uh, and they asked me, like, you know, what did you think of that? I was looking at the board, what were you looking at? And I, I looked at the video as well. I don't even think he really made strange faces. It's just... So he doesn't make a move and walk away? I don't know. I mean, you might, but I just don't care at all. Like, I mean... If you're smoking in my face, which is against the rule, then I'm going to be mad. But realistically, if I don't notice my opponent's board matter, and I don't care. And I like, think people who do worry about this stuff are too sensitive. But, 
Uh, other questions? I just want to wander out with that because Board Minor was anything on your show is very question. Yes. Uh, if we are only uh, providing three pieces of advice for young players who are starting out playing chess, what would they be? First, and the biggest one by far, is definitely play for the love of the game. Uh, the second one would be to accept that chess is difficult. Don't try to fight that and embrace the adversity. And the third would be that hard work tends to trump talent. And if you're smarter than someone, it doesn't matter. If they're smarter than you, it doesn't matter. What matters is you work smarter. Any other questions? Yes. Do you think some brains are more cut off for chess and others are cut off for other things? Like like yes, of course, some people are more talented at chess than others. Some people have greater proclivity for math or music or running or anything. Or Chess, like anything else, is something that some people are better at. And chess, like anything else, is something that can be perfected and trained. So, you know, not, I, I don't want to go say anyone on Earth can go become the world chess champion, but I will say anyone on Earth can make 23, 2400 or something. I mean, like, if you really, really dedicate your life to it, which, I mean, I wouldn't recommend doing if you don't have, you know, a fair amount of natural talents. But, I mean, I, I've always thought you get to like the top 1% of just about anything you want. I remember a conversation I had with my mother one time when I had a, I ran a 545 mile. My mom, who I think at the time was in her late 50s, and it's was like five feet tall, said, oh, I could never do that. I'm like, really? Never? You're telling me if you didn't, you know, sell your house and abandon your family and move to Kenya tomorrow and just spend your entire, all of your savings hiring the best running coaches that they have and the best nutritionists they have, and every single day doing nothing but doing everything you can to become the best runner. You don't think you'd make it? I mean, I'm, obviously I don't want her to do that. I mean, she's my mom, I miss her. But uh, the point is, I think people really can make it a lot farther than they believe if, uh, yeah, some minds are more naturally inclined towards chess, but I have my opinions about who the best players in the world are and which, uh, which ones are the most talented, and I can tell you, you know, the, in terms of who's the most talented compared to who's the best, it's not always linear. It's often not even close. Did you say who's talented and who's more hardworking? Uh, among current players, I'll keep my mouth shut on that, but among players in the past, I think, for example, I mean, Kasparov, for example, is very, very talented, but I think by the rarefied standards of world champions, if you compare his level of talent to some of the others, like Anand, I think he was quite a bit behind. Yet, I think he, you know, has, has proved it. I mean, until Magnus came along, he was clearly the best player of all time. And, you know, and it's disingenuous to say Kasparov isn't talented because he's probably like a one in a million level talent, but that's not necessarily as high as the absolute best in the world. I mean, Kasparov himself even was saying that he got largely where he was due to the work he did and revolutionized it. He was clearly the hardest working guy at the top, and that's why he dominated for so long. Again, you can never say one of the best players in the world isn't talented because in a vacuum, in like a room, like if you just took a thousand people off the street and put them in there, they're almost certainly the most talented one. But, uh, you know, it's really work that separates it. Other questions? Yes. Another question. Um, so, looking at the room, there are fewer um, women and girls than you know, male. That's kind of the, the trend in the chess world. So, what do you think would bring more girls into chess as a sport? Uh, that's obviously a very contentious topic. That a lot of people have very different opinions on. We've heard a lot of different attitudes toward that, of which precisely zero have worked. Um, I think the best thing you can do is look at yourself on an individual level and do whatever you can to bring more girls into the sport as opposed to think what can everybody do because everybody should just make that decision. As for what you can do as an individual, uh, if you're an adult, you can teach your daughter chess. If you're a kid playing, when you play against the girl, you can treat her with respect and not make foul comments if you lose or something like that. Um, in general, I think you should do that to anybody. I mean, you should try to just play good sportsmanship. But in general, I think teaching a girl to play chess will do a lot more than philosophizing about the importance or, of women's tournaments. Should they exist? Or are they demeaning or are they inspiring? I mean, people debate this all day long, all the time. It, it leads absolutely nowhere. The best thing you can do is just teach girls to play. Yes? How do you tell a good game 
to study to a bad game to study? Um, if it's a game that is played, it's probably a bad game to study. Most of them are, honestly. Uh, the best games to study are probably your own games because you will see your own weaknesses displayed. Um, I think, uh, in general, if you look at chess space, a game that's heavily annotated probably has a fair amount of value in it, while a game that's empty is going to be, even if it's a good game to study, it's going to be harder to learn from just because nobody is like, talking about it. But uh, I don't know. Um, I guess just look for games that are well annotated. In general, I think a not so good game to study that's been clearly taken, that someone has taken a lot of time, someone strong has taken time to look at and explain will be more valuable than like the most brilliant game ever that's blank and has no opinions attached to it. <coughs> yes? <laughs> well, I've always played a lot of openings, and I think that's kind of important. Um, I think you need to develop a very broad understanding of chess because you need to play every kind of position that comes in front of you. Like, there are guys who have just never played the Sicilian in their life, who've just been D4 their whole entire life, and like only play like, you know, E5 or French or things. These people tend not to be able to learn to play very dynamic chess. Well, guys who only ever play Sicilian King's Gambit, things like this, they're you're not usually going to learn to play positional chess. I've always had a soft spot for the Sicilian just because I really like both colors and the semi slot of like these wild, complicated positions. But uh, you can't really have a favorite, especially at my level when you're getting prepared for heavily. If you're not surprising people, you're not going to get good positions out of the opening very often. We have time for one more question. Who wants the last one? Yes. Uh, like a lot of times in tournaments, like if you have a really tough game and like you lose, a lot of people like start losing more games or like go downhill. What do you think is like the best way to like recover after losing like a really painful game? Mental fortitude is a very important skill, and it's one that I did not always have, and now I do. I think this could be shown when I resigned a technically drawn position against the Nishkiri and became the laughing stock of the chess world and I came back and crushed the Banyashi the next day. Um, strength of character is something that generally comes with age and when you get old like me, uh, you will, um, you'll have the life experience and know that losing isn't the worst thing. It also helps as you get better at chess and you uh, have a day to recover, like it's one game per day. If you, ask, if you lose a tough game, then just play the next one, but uh, it's very tough. I do like a rule that I heard from a former really strong American junior, Darwin Yang, but as far as I know, it doesn't apply anymore. Is he said when he loses a game, he gives himself exactly one hour to complain, whine, throw a tantrum, punch pillows, do whatever the heck he wants, and no one's allowed to stop him from making a big baby about it. And then after that one hour, he must then give it up and focus on the next game. I think it's a very good idea. It gets all of your negative emotions out in a way that cannot be contained. And then after that hour, you force yourself to have the discipline to focus on the next one. I like that rule a lot. I think it, it, it certainly works for him, and I know a lot of people it works for as well. I go and have a drink. Uh, as for alcohol, I personally, starting three days before a tournament until the last round is over, I don't touch any, and I wouldn't recommend anybody else touch any. I'm not going to be the guy who stands up there and says, one drop is going to kill you. But you definitely, it does even if it's not going to be like dangerous towards you to have one drink, it's not going to do your like brain power any favors. And if you're operating at 90% brain power, that's really not a problem in most of the time, but when you're playing chess, trust me, it is. I would not recommend having any alcohol during tournaments. Okay, last one. Yeah. At your level, how much income do you make from playing chess? $100 billion, Dr. <laughs> Evil style. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'll earn, I earn a good living, let's just leave it at that. Just playing chess related. I mean, playing, I, I, earn a, I earn a comfortable living just playing, and when you combine events like this and writing and teaching, it's a very good living. Okay, okay. Uh, so that'll be it. I've got books and DVDs for sale for all who want, and then uh, just take a lunch break and call from there. Thank you. I'll be too long. <laughs> <laughs>